This is Thinking in Public, a program dedicated to intelligent conversation about frontline theological and cultural issues with the people who are shaping them. I'm Albert Moeller, your host and president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. George Packer is an acclaimed journalist and award-winning author, enjoying a distinguished career at publications like The New Yorker and The Atlantic. A graduate of Yale College, Mr. Packer covered the war in Iraq for The New Yorker from 2003 to 2018. He presently serves as a staff writer for The Atlantic. He's won a National Book Award. Much of his journalism covers American foreign policy. His biography, Our Man, Richard Holbrook and the End of the American Century, chronicled the life of one of the most influential U.S. diplomats of that century and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. He's the author of numerous books. His latest book, Last Best Hope, America in Crisis and Renewal, is the topic of our conversation today. George Packer, welcome to Thinking in Public. Thanks for having me. You know, your new book, Last Best Hope, America and Crisis and Renewal, uh, is in many ways uh, a continuation of the work you've done before. I think I've read just about all of your major your major books. Why this book at this time? What was the spark that brought this about? Well, most of my previous works have been long narrative uh, books based on a lot of reporting, a lot of research, travel, uh, talking to a lot of different people. The subject has been America and Americans uh, all the way through. Um, this time I was trapped by the pandemic. I couldn't move. I couldn't travel. I couldn't really do meaningful interviews. And for me, they have to be face to face to be meaningful. Zoom is the animus, the enemy of, of intimacy. Um, and so I thought I should make some use of my enforced, um, isolation in, in collecting thoughts I've been working toward and, and wrestling with for all these years, as I've been reporting on the state of the country and trying to understand, uh, the direction the United States has taken in the last two decades. And instead of a piece of narrative reported journalism, it's a, I've, what I've written is an essay. Essentially, it's a short book. It's a it's it's not per se an argument because it's more of an exploration, more of a meditation. It doesn't start with a strong point of view and and pound you with it for 200 pages. Instead, it arrives at certain conclusions, but only after passing through a look at first the moment in which I wrote it, which is the last months of 2020, the first month of 2021, dramatic time in American history. 2020 was one of those years that will go down in history as a year of uh, tremendous upheaval and drama, but also to look back Part of the advantage of, of being forced to sit in one place is you can read, you can think, you can look at history, you can read great writers like Tocqueville, Whitman, uh, Walter Lippmann. Those were my companions in order to try to understand what it is about today that seems connected to um, American history, to our past, and therefore might offer some sense of a path forward. So essentially I, I made a virtue of a bad situation and wrote uh, essentially a long essay about America today, but looking at both the recent past and then the, the deep past going all the way back to uh, the early 19th century. Yeah. In your work, uh, The Unwinding, uh, which is subtitled, I think, An Inner History of the New America, uh, you go into several different uh, locations, follow several different persons as a kind of a metaphors for uh, what you see as the America that was unwinding. I want to go back to that work because I see a lot of it actually in the, in the Last Best Hope book. Wh why did you say that America was unwinding then? It's a phrase I heard from one of the main people in that book, Dean Price, who is uh, a son of tobacco country in Western North Carolina, who comes from a long line of tobacco farmers and whose life has coincided with the decline of that region, both tobacco and textiles and furniture, 
were the three mainstays of the Piedmont region of, of North Carolina, and they all collapsed in very rapid order around the turn of, of the 20th and 21st century. That was Dean's life, and he spoke of unwinding, but not to describe that collapse, but to describe what he thought of as the solution to that collapse, which in his view was to somehow extricate ourselves from the economy that he sees as part of the cause of the collapse, an economy in which um, cheap imports have replaced American manufacturing, in which food is trucked thousands of miles rather than sold where it's grown, in which energy is imported from countries uh, that have no love of the United States or its values, and in fact, might wish us harm. He wanted to go back to the 19th century. And his answer was to use locally grown canola in those fallow tobacco fields in order to make biodiesel uh, and to essentially turn the energy economy of his region into um, renewable, into a, a green economy. And he had mixed results as a businessman and as a, in some ways, he was a kind of 19th century figure to me, a bit of a traveling salesman slash um, evangelist for his cause, which was biodiesel. And he spoke about it with eloquence and wit and down-home authenticity in a way that charmed me and made me want to follow him and listen to him for, for weeks and weeks. But when he said unwinding, he meant essentially unwinding the modern economy of fast food and cheap imported oil and uh, cheap Chinese made um, products and instead go back to something local in which people could renew their community right where they stood by producing local, buying local, consuming local. So that was what he meant by the unwinding. Yeah. Yeah. Your book uh, won the National Book Award. I mean, it was it was clearly understood to be a uh, a very insightful snapshot or set of snapshots, actually, of, of America in this uh, kind of early 21st century maelstrom. The the book Last Best Hope, America in Crisis and Renewal is one I really wanted to talk about. Because of uh, the way you look at America, and I think, uh, and I say this as a as a tribute, you uh, you understand that the politics is downstream from something, and uh, you kind of track that back to four tributaries. Now, going back to Aristotle, whoever controls classifications controls the argument. Huh. So I actually want to invite mm -hmm. you to control the argument for a bit here yeah. by uh, by laying out your classifications of of the four Americas. I think I think you know anyone. Uh, Business, culture, politics, and including in a, a American uh, uh, church life, and I, I speak as an evangelical Christian, should find your classifications uh, very interesting. Free America, smart America, real America, and just America. Uh, lay that out for us. I think that's really the, the, the most yeah. important contribution of your book. Yeah, I became a taxonomist, and it's something I don't really love doing because I think any shorthand like that has many dangers, uh, sure. oversimplification and leaving things out and uh, c caricaturing. Normally what I do is write about the person sitting in front of me. Right. Uh, and there I feel that I have the attention and the empathy to do it justice. In this case, because as I said, I was unable to go and travel and interview, I was dealing in the realm of ideas, but your the Aristotle quote is apropos. Um, I have been thinking for a while that red and blue, the divide we've been living with for about two decades now as a shorthand, is inadequate to describing the narratives that Americans carry in their heads of who we are, what it means to be American, um, what the history of the country says about us, and where we should go, what kind of country we want to be. I think really there are these, the dominant narratives of my adult life have been these four. And there's a sort of sequence to them as well. 
I begin with Free America, which really came into political power in the late 70s and early 80s with Ronald Reagan and with essentially uh, a narrative of free markets, of um, strongly pro-business, low taxes, deregulation, get the government out of my life. You know the whole. It's it's essentially the Reagan um, rhetoric, which was so eloquent. And so I listened to some of his speeches from the 1980 campaign. And even though uh, I didn't vote for him, I found them (laughs) quite uh, mesmerizing. I mean, he made that America sound like, as he put it, the shining city on the hill of the Puritans. Um, it was the, st- of the four narratives, free America has been the most potent politically. It, it dominated our politics. It set the terms of debate. It changed what you could talk about and, and what you couldn't. And really it had a, an effect on the Democratic Party as well as on the Republican Party. I would say by the early 2000s, it was becoming clear that um, for all the appeal of freedom, which really mostly meant free markets um, in, in the Reagan uh, rhetoric, had not delivered on the promise of widespread prosperity and instead had led to winners and losers that were really fairly extreme. Um, to a, an ownership class, an investment class, uh, a corporate class that was doing better and better. And it seemed that no matter whether it was recession or boom, whether it was a Republican or Democrat in the White House, the rich kept getting richer. And the hollowing out of many communities that had depended on either industry or agriculture, like Dean Price's Western North Carolina, Um, falling further and further behind, again, no matter the state of the economy or of our politics. And this was obviously connected to globalization, technological change, uh, the replacement of the industrial economy by the information economy. But in the end, the Reagan recipe did not produce the shining city on the hill. And in each of the four narratives, there's the promise, there's the appeal, and then there's the failure. The second I call smart America. That's essentially the America I grew up in and live in. That is the America of the educated professional class of the meritocrats, as they're called. And I think Bill and Hillary Clinton are probably the boat and Barack Obama are the um, the evangels of smart America and the examples of smart America because they all came from humble beginnings and through education and intelligence and ambition and energy and talent, they rose to the heights Meritocracy sounds like a fair system because it um, says you will advance as far as your talents and efforts can take you. And to the best, to the most energetic, to the smartest go the rewards. The problem with meritocracy has been that it has become a kind of class system rather than a system of equal opportunity. As social mobility has declined, as your birth becomes more and more the determinant of your destiny in this country, and our rates of social mobility, which used to far exceed Europe's, are now below Europe's. So the American dream of rising and of passing on to the next generation have have uh, not been achieved in the last few decades. Meritocracy has become a form of aristocracy where Educated professionals pass on to their children all the advantages, the connections, the they speak 10,000 words a day, they play Beethoven to three-year-olds, they get them into the right preschool, they have the right test prep tutors, they get them into the right U.S. News and World Report rated colleges and into the right professions, generally law, finance, medicine, uh, media. This has become an aristocratic system in which these advantages are passed on from generation to generation. You are born a meritocrat today. You don't become one. And the chances of a poor American getting into a top Ivy League college are no better today than they were in 1954. After all the efforts, all the opening of those colleges to a more diverse group of of candidates. So smart America has also failed on its promise. And because of those failures, the other two narratives, real and just America, are expressions of disillusionment and of um, alienation from the promise of American life, from the optimistic narratives. Real America 
is a phrase Sarah Palin used in 2008 on a campaign stop very near Dean Price's hometown in North Carolina. It was actually to a group of donors. And what I've learned watching politics over the years is candidates only tell the truth to their donors. Hillary Clinton talked about deplorables to her donors. Mitt Romney talked about the 47% takers to his donors. Barack Obama talked about guns and religion to his donors. Sarah Palin talked about the real America to her donors. And what she meant, I think, was the kind of people who were in that region. And basically, she meant white Christian working people. And she described them as the patriotic, hardworking people who grow our food and teach our children and fight our wars. And she was distinguishing them from people in the cities, from people on the coasts, um, from smart Americans, elites, who somehow are less real, somehow are less the kind of people who are the heart and backbone of the country. So it was a, a sort of divisive phrase that I think captured a picture of who is American and who has less of a claim. And for me, Sarah Palin was John the Baptist to Donald Trump. She led the way. She created a kind of identity for a new politics that was really not Reaganism any longer. It did not speak the language of, uh, of endless opportunity based on, um, on entrepreneurial act activity. It was more pessimistic. It was about America in decline, America being taken over by immigrants, by the wrong kind of people, and um, the need for to get back to an America that was the real America. And that, I think, became Trump's potent argument for why Hillary Clinton should be rejected by the American people. She had failed the real Americans. The last of the narratives I called just America, and those were the young people in the streets last summer. Those are, it's a generational rebellion against me, against my generation, the boomers, against the parents, the, the smart Americans who promise that if you work hard and go to the right school, you'll have a good life. And younger people today look at the country and say, this is not a just country. In fact, we've been born in injustice. We, in some ways, were conceived in original sin, the sin of slavery. And we have made very little progress and we will not make progress until we confront the darkness at the heart of America and somehow extirpate it. So like real America, just America is a more pessimistic narrative that seems to have the uh, upper hand because so many Americans today feel that the country is in decline and have, have become disenchanted with uh, the, the promises of 1776 and 1863. Um, and so it's a, it, just America, I think of as a kind of generational rebellion. Um, and in many ways, just and real America, which are of course politically at odds, if not at war with each other, have things in common. They tend toward the extremes. They tend to reject ordinary politics as being somehow corrupt um, and and worth worthless. Um, and they moralize politics. They they want politics politics to be public morality, the the public version of what they think of as morality, which is actually how Robespierre defined politics, public morality, which led to the guillotine. So there's a a kind of um, retributive and uh, punitive quality on both sides of that divide, and and those and those narratives have, I think, led us to a pretty dangerous impasse where we can't talk to each other any longer across lines of ideology and identity. Yeah, you know, I appreciate you taking the time to lay that out. I'm and sorry I, it took I, me so long. Well, I, I kind of expected that it would. That's unusual for this kind of conversation, uh, but. I wanted to get that much out in order to come back and yeah. uh, and first of all say that your uh, your typological uh, project there uh, in in making the classifications I think is is helpful simply because we're all trying to understand the country we're all trying to understand the fissures uh, in this country um, as a theologian and Christian thinker I'm I'm looking at the uh, the fissures along the lines of just basic worldview and theological assessment and assumptions what presuppositions are driving this, but also what moral urgencies are behind 
uh, different arguments in the United States. I don't, I don't know when you were born, but I, I was born in 1959. But I do know because of 60. one of your books. There you go. I do know because of one of your books that we voted uh, both in our first presidential election in 1980. And I just learned that we canceled each other out. But uh, I, but you, uh, you ended up winning <laughs> uh, by a landslide. Uh, but that, <laughs> but uh, that's a, just a part of the American story. I worked for Ronald Reagan in 1976 when I was 16 as a uh, high school organizer. I tell people I was one of the officers of high school students for uh, Ronald Reagan, but that was not a mass movement. Uh, but uh, mm-hmm. but nonetheless, I was, uh, it was very an insurgency. Much, it deliberately and uh, and celebratedly. I I uh, I was. Uh, I was really looking for ideas and and what I believed were the right ideas. And uh, Ronald Reagan was running a campaign of ideas. And it got right down to the level of what we were talking about, even uh, where the volunteers are stuffing envelopes. And uh, it it, it was a genuine, uh, far far more, I think, than either the Republican establishment has ever understood. Uh, and and many on the left in the media uh, have understood it, it was it was really a very idea driven uh, what we would say would be a principle driven uh, political movement. Now, by the time Ronald Reagan gained the nomination in 1980, uh, it was not exactly what it was in 1976 because by 1980, uh, and when he when the general election came, uh, he was running against uh, Jimmy Carter rather than Gerald Ford. But uh, your description of free America also includes, I think it's very interesting, you would put Burkean conservatives, and I raised my hand there, and, uh, and, and kind of traditional Christian uh, uh, churches and, and, and institutions and groups in that free America. Um, and, and that just points to the fact that every one of these collectives includes people who are there kind of awkwardly. So, for instance, um, even though uh, your free America is kind of based upon a libertarian dream. And, and of course, with uh, the, the, the free markets at the, at the very center of that, uh, an awful lot of the conservative concern at that time was the, um, the state of the culture and the direction of the culture. And so an awful lot of the people who, were, who you would now put in uh, real America were people who, if they had been alive 40 years ago in 1980, uh, would have been in what you call free America, but they're very frustrated with the Republican establishment as much as with the Democratic establishment. Exactly. I mean, I don't think the narrative of real America had emerged in 1980. Um, it, that's why I, th- I think there's been a sequence. These have evolved through history. Uh, they aren't permanent. And in fact, I should add that there's always competing narratives there's always competing ideas of what the country is. Um, but th- I think these narratives have reached a dangerous point in which they cannot allow for the existence of the other. They see each other as existential threats. It's increasingly abs- a zero-sum game. Yeah, it's a zero-sum game. It's a fight for scarce status, scarce resources, scarce power. But you're absolutely right that in 1980, free America appealed to all kinds of people, whether they were blue collar Democrats in Wayne County and Macomb County, Michigan, or whether they were the rising Sunbelt and middle American evangelicals, or whether they were California um, self, you know, self-employed businessmen, or whether they were corporate executives on the East Coast. Freedom was the underlying principle, and it may have meant different things to different people. It, to, a, to an evangelical Christian, it might have meant freedom from the government's interference in how they raise their children or how they educate their children. But I think those tensions were there from the beginning. Yeah. You and know, at, uh, yeah. No, uh, uh, FDR, uh, President Roosevelt, referred to the uh, forgotten American and uh, claimed to speak on their behalf. Ronald Reagan did the same thing. But uh, Ronald Reagan said that the forgotten Americans, actually, a, a, you know, a 60 year old white guy who get, got off work and came home, was watching evening news, sitting in a Naga Hyde recliner in Milwaukee. And uh, I think that the realignment of American politics has a very great deal to do with the fact that that those were forgotten Americans. I guess one question that maybe we should talk about is what was it that led that man and the let's call it the white working class 
yeah. to abandon the Democratic Party and go to the Republican Party, um, because that is sort of the the most important political demographic move of our lifetime, I think. It has really changed how politics works. And there are several possible reasons. The, the left says racism, sexism, xenophobia, um, hostility to modern secular life, to cities, all that. Um, I say it has to do more with the evaporation of a whole way of life, which really depended on jobs for people who didn't have college degrees, good jobs. And when those jobs disappeared, an amazingly devastating event that essentially got very little attention from the federal government. There was no industrial policy to try to reorient millions of people toward a, a life that could sustain them. I think the Democratic Party became a party that no longer had anything to offer the people who had been its base, the blue collar union, uh, Democratic voting American. And the, the Republican Party, which I don't think had anything to offer them on the economic front either, at least took their values seriously and didn't speak about clinging to guns and religion. And so if the government's going to do nothing for me, I'm at least going to vote for the party that doesn't look down on me. Yeah, let me offer an alternative. See, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'd say uh, uh, a se maybe several points of alternative, but for sake of time, I'll keep them brief. Uh, I think what, uh, uh, and you will know this very well, you've covered all this in, in your writings. I, th I, I wonder about the chronology, though, of the, uh, of the massive economic dislocation, because it, I, I would argue a lot of that came later than, say, the late 1970s, uh, when Detroit was actually doing extremely well, for instance. Uh, and, and then by the time you get to the end of the 80s, you see, you see something coming, but only in the 90s does it take much, uh, much formal shape. But, you know, if you, if you go back to, say, the, the last half of the 20th century, you would have an enormous number of labor, uh, labor union members who clearly voted, for instance, in 1968 uh, for Richard Nixon, who addressed himself to this you know, silent majority. But the, the point I want to make is this, that, that, that consensus during the Cold War in which you, you, the labor unions and both of the political parties clearly saw the enemy as uh, Soviet communism. And so there was a commitment to this American democratic little D project. Uh, an awful lot of the, that a lot of all of those guys sitting in Nagahide recliners in Milwaukee came to the conclusion that the Democratic Party was the enemy of that project, or at least the, the ascendant uh, elites were the enemy of that uh, project. weren't speaking for them, and uh, so they were looking for who would speak to what they thought of. And that's why when you say real America came later, I get that. But Ronald Reagan's messaging, like Morning in America, and the rest that that, that was that was speaking. I mean, and I was very much a part of that. Was uh, was speaking to that sense that. The, the um, American project is being subverted by one side in this uh, cultural context. And if, uh, if not consistently, at least is uh, overwhelmingly more supported they saw by the other. Does that make now sense? I, now I'm going to argue with you because if uh -huh. that guy in the Naugahyde recliner was in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, and maybe in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, it's, to me, it's, it's inarguable that the civil rights movement had something to do with the fact that he became a Republican. It happened overnight between 1960 and 64, uh, when the whole solid South flipped and became either, uh, it became essentially Goldwater Republicans and then were pretty much gone for the, for the duration with maybe a little, blip for Jimmy Carter because he was a Southerner himself. But so I don't see how you can leave the rise of a multi everything, as I call it, democracy yeah. out of the picture of how this class, Northern and Southern, um, migrated across party lines. I guess I don't, I don't deny that, is, that. I it's, don't deny it's this a, part. It's a complex, yeah. multi-causal yeah phenomenon it yeah no i don't i don't explains it yeah i don't doubt that uh that that's a part of uh of the equation i don't doubt that and by the way i was in birmingham at that time not in milwaukee i i went to college 
uh, in Birmingham, Alabama. Where? And uh, Samford University. Okay, my mother went to Birmingham Southern. She's uh, from Birmingham. Yep. In, in town rival. God bless her. Uh, and your grandfather had been a member of Congress. Yeah, he represented yeah. Birmingham in Congress for 22 years. Uh, yeah. And he was an interesting, not to change the subject, but it may have some relevance. He was an interesting figure because he was a, uh, as he called it, a Jeffersonian Democrat, which to him meant in simple terms, on the side of the, the common man, the ordinary yeah. guy, which meant miners, farmers, and steel workers. And those were his con- constituents. And those were the Democrats who are now voting their children and grandchildren for Reagan and for Trump. So that's part of the migration. Yeah. But not long ago, they were voting for George Huddleston, my grandfather, who was, con- who was called the little Bolshevik. By the Birmingham News, because yep. he was such an ardent pro labor um, Democrat. So that that's yep. uh, in a nutshell, that's the history. Yeah, and 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 the two of us. That's why a conversation like this is a lot of fun. The two of us come from very different worlds. One of my uh, uh, strongest friends uh, in in my uh, in in my life and work uh, has been uh, Albert Lee Smith. Uh, who I guess had your grandfather's seat in Congress later as a Reagan Republican. That's right. And so it's just, it's a very interesting situation. I, I will tell you, I don't, I want to be intellectually honest. Uh, you can't remove race uh, from, from this equation. I wouldn't dare to. But I can tell you that in the world I inhabited, there was no overt uh, uh, use of any kind of racial argument or racial symbolism. Now, it doesn't mean it wasn't there. I understand text and subtext. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it was thereby, thereby uh, uh, safe to say that race was not an issue. I can just say that the animating concerns of the world in which I lived uh, were the larger direction of the culture related to issues like abortion, uh, uh, sexuality issues, but just the larger sense that the culture uh, was no longer in con- uh, under any kind of continuing project. I, for sake of time, I want to ask you when we get to smart America, and I, I don't want, I, I'm happy for you to go anywhere you want to go here, but with smart America, you know, uh, when you talk about meritocracy, what I, I struggle with is, and, and again, we come from very different places because I'm, I'm a big believer in meritocracy. I don't believe it's a perfect system, but I'm a big believer in it because I think, number one, it's, 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 it's inevitable in some sense, uh, even among the people who say they're, they're trying to undo meritocracy. The very fact that they get to be giving the speech means somewhere there's a meritocracy somewhere. And they may well just be preserving their own place in it by denouncing it. Could, could, could be. And I'll just say that. Could be. But, uh, but I think your parents were both professors at Stanford. And well, uh, My father died a long time ago, but he was. And my mother is now 96, and oh, she wow. was. But I, yeah, she's still among us. So yeah, I come from an academic family. Well, and, and I, I, I'm... Yeah. I'm Sure, you're proud of that, and I, I think that's remarkable. And, and uh, so I take nothing away from that. I simply want to say that when I think of meritocracy, I think about the fact that I was a first generation college graduate, and I'm president of an institution where the largest percentage of undergraduate students are first to, are, are first uh, time college uh, students in, in in their families, and so uh, I kind of represent the fact that uh, in hope. And then the investment of my life, uh, an awful lot of it's in this, uh, in, in the sense that I want more people to benefit by uh, a meritocratic uh, system whereby people like me, who had a grocery store manager for a father, can end up being president of an academic institution. I, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I'm, I'm just concerned that uh, to get to sneak into it and to get through it has become more and more difficult because uh, the competition is stiff. And there's a whole, I live in a world in which families are constantly maneuvering to secure the best places for their kids in the belief that anything else is failure and a steep fall down into the class of people who shop at Walmart. So that is, for me, a a betrayal of meritocracy, not the not the real thing. And so I'm criticizing my own class. It may be the harshest criticism in my book is reserved for for my own class. No, no I get that. And I respect that. I, I really respect uh, uh, you as a writer and thinker. Uh, I just want to say that uh, an awful lot of, the, of, of America is not 
in, in terms of uh, the structure of meritocracy. Uh, worried about uh, you know how many Suzuki lessons they can fit in and uh, and all the rest in order to to get into their kid into the Dalton school in order to you know go to the St. Yeah, Paul school to get goes, to Yale. It goes deeper than that. Mm-hmm. Don't you worry that the numbers of uh, the, the the statistics on who leaves their hometown versus who stays on who goes to college and who doesn't on whether that's passed on generation to generation, have shown a kind of stagnation. And as I said, a freezing of our mobility rather than a loosening of it to make it more fluid. I'm all for a fluid social system. We have become a much more stratified one in the last 40 or 50 years, which is, I think, one of the main themes of my book and one of the main causes of our discontents. And so I'm I'm trying to figure out if that's right. I'm just ah, trying to figure out well, if that's right. Uh, and I'll send I know, you some numbers when we're done. <laughs> no, thank you. And, and look, I, I think I'm pretty familiar with the numbers, but always glad to receive more. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, I, I grew up in a, in a house in which I was, you know, I guess you say barely middle class. Uh, my father had a very good job with a very good company. Um, but, uh, but I grew up in a house in Florida without air conditioning. You know, 900 square feet was the big house uh, with four kids. Uh, and, and, and so I look back and say, well, read from the way an awful lot of econometrics would be done now, that would be described as an incredibly underprivileged uh, background. And I, I kind of would rather have had air conditioning uh, during those years. But I, I just want to say, look, that, again, when I, when I deal with uh, this issue, I just want to say I want more people in it, but I don't want to destroy what I think has been the main engine for reversing the the rigid class structures of the past in which I would not be a part of this conversation. Uh, I want more people to be represented there, but I don't, I haven't seen another engine in world history that has produced so much prosperity and freedom and, uh, and access. Well, I think your, your own experiences is, is remarkable and admirable, but don't draw entirely on what you were able to do especially in your generation, in our generation. We grew up in a country that was still, I would call it, a middle-class democracy, the post-war middle-class democracy in which there was an understanding between labor and business and government that all three had an important role to play in broadening prosperity to all Americans. It was a mixed economy uh, in which labor unions played a part, Business played a part, but business didn't dominate. It recognized limits. And government had an essential role in ensuring equal opportunity and some sense of fairness. And I think, I mean, you may disagree, but I think the story of the last 50 years has been the the breakdown of that contract, that unwritten contract. Uh, And it's been replaced by a more, I would say, Darwinian social order that has left us with haves and half nots that didn't exist in such stratified, rigid terms half a century ago. Today, if you'd leave any major city and go into the countryside a few dozen miles, you're going to start running into poverty and despair and unemployment and college, you know, high school dropouts and opioid addiction Everywhere across this country, that that's not a just a general moral. It cannot be a moral failure of a whole generation. It has something to do with the failure of the economy to um, to continue to extend opportunity. Yeah. Now, I think you uh, you you work very hard uh, to uh, to actually rightly report on the people that you write about, for instance, in the unwinding and and when you describe the nation. I just want to say I don't live in New York. I live in Louisville, Kentucky. And I spend almost all of my time uh, with the people that are often described in, in the terms. I mean, I live I, 15 minutes from, from my house. I'm, uh, I, I, I'm right in the midst of uh, the flyover country um, in, in terms of the people who aren't even on the screen. But I just I did look at this and say, what I see on the left, and I, by that, I don't mean that disparagingly, just descriptively. What I say on the left is the fact that when you told the story about uh, so even some of the people in the unwinding, uh, I think as a Christian theologian, I got to say there are structures of creation that if, uh, if weakened, such as marriage and the family, 
then uh, children, I think the biggest issue is not the, the giant economic forces. I don't deny those, but I have to say the, the greatest strength, I believe, uh, and health poured into the life of children is, is when the family structure and the neighborhood structure is, in, is very much intact. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. But I think the moral and social cohesion that you're describing is intimately connected to the economic and social foundation of a community, which yeah. is why in, in my world, the divorce rate is minimal. Right. People think of the cities and of modern cosmopolitan mm -hmm. people as passing through marriages, all that. No, people stay together. They eat their dinners together. They uh, read pour the themselves into their night. children. They pour themselves. It's almost obscene how much time parents in my world spend on their children. Whereas in a lot of parts of the country, there's no common dinner table. Uh, the, the, to your point, there is no church on Sunday because that institution has lost hold of more and more people. There is no union. There is no local newspaper. All the institutions that sustain what I think of as a, a viable middle class democratic life in this country have unwound. That was the theme of the unwinding. And in Last Best Hope, I've tried to explain, as I see it, why that's happened and what we can do to try to make uh, the country coherent again and, and a, a, be a better life for most Americans. So well, the I'm not other, sure we the other, disagree yeah. about all of that. No, I'm sure we don't disagree about all of it. I, 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 otherwise, it wouldn't be any purpose of the conversation. That's I, true. I, and, and I found that, again, I found your book incredibly interesting. And uh, just for the sake of time, I, have, I just have to move on from Smart America to say, look, I think a part of where the left and the right in this country I now share an enormous amount of common concern is about the inordinate power of uh, the digital empires and uh, Silicon Valley. And so it's interesting. I looked at uh, just the, the three major uh, national papers today, and uh, almost uh, every one of them will have uh, articles just day by day on, uh, you got a Republican member of Congress, a Democratic member of Congress, both saying, you know, we, we need curbs on this or that. May disagree about what needs to be done, but there's a common perception that this digital uh, revolution has come at an enormous cost. Yeah, I was writing about it 11 years ago, and I was called a Luddite by the technology reporter of the New York Times because I looked at Twitter and I said, Twitter is crack for media addicts. It's going to make them incapable. People in media are, will become incapable of, of thinking, arguing, writing. They will simply be tweeting. And that has come to pass for a lot of uh, people in my industry. And it's had this destructive effect on our discourse and on our politics because we no longer really are interested in answering each other, in thinking hard about a viewpoint we don't like, uh, and coming up with a counter argument of essentially having the conversation that you and I are, are having right now. Yeah. So it's a rare thing. And I wish there were more forums for it. I wish my idea is if we had national service in this country, Americans of every background would have to get to know one another in a way they never do now because our lives are mm -hmm. in silos in bubbles. Right. And even if there's just a, a few minor environmental projects or infrastructure projects, or if it's military service, whatever it is, it would be a good experience because Americans would have to get to know one another again and realize right. that this Certainly is not, agree that would be a good this thing. is not the enemy. Yeah. This is uh, this is my countryman or countrywoman. Just to try to summarize here, at least uh, I hope I, I do so accurately, and maybe I do some from inside uh, in this case. Uh, at least some in what you describe as free America of, of the, say that Reagan era, Reagan revolution, became uh, disenchanted, uh, even with the Republican Party and uh, and with uh, even uh, some free market, uh, certainly uh, free trade kind of uh, agreements and uh, resorted to what you call real America, which is driven by a lot of resentments. I mean, no one can deny that. It's driven by a, a lot of resentments and a sense that everything's broken. And the sense in which on the right, the only way to fix this is maybe to break it more and, uh, and, and hope that something better comes out of it. Uh, 
real America is a continuing thing. I just, I just, I, I guess I wonder where in your mind, uh, you know, Berkey and conservatives and uh, traditional uh, evangelical Protestant Christians, uh, conservative Catholics, that matter. Where do you see us falling now? Where are we? So, tell, tell me my address. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of you have become never Trumpers. Um, I'd say the more traditional Berkey and conservatives are more likely to take that route and to say this is not conservatism. This is something much more destructive and much more uh, anti-traditional, anti-institutional. Uh, Donald Trump does not talk about self-government. He doesn't talk about the Constitution. He talks about I alone can fix it and I am the voice of the people. He's a populist. And a Burkean conservative looks at a populist and, and sees a, a dictator. So I think for some, that has been the direction, but they're homeless. They're homeless. I'm a bit homeless too. So I actually feel quite a lot of sympathy for the, the never Trump Republicans. Um, I think this, the polls show that evangelical Protestants have become Trump's strongest supporters. And it seems that the man can't do anything to antagonize a lot of them. There are a few of them, people like Michael Gerson and Peter Weiner, writers like that, who have who stopped calling themselves evangelical because they think it now means essentially Trumpist. Um, but it is, to me, one of the the really hard to understand. Um, I mean, I understand it, but just really hard to rationalize how a movement based on moral principles in the 1980s uh, with the, the early uh, new right has become uh, a cult of a highly immoral um, and destructive figure like Trump. But yeah, that's, I, I that's would say that's me. reductionistic. That's just me. It's all right. It's honest. But I think that's reductionistic because I think the classical conservatives are uh, and, and Michael Gerson and Pete Weiner and I, and I, I know them, but we're, we're in a very different place here. And I know, uh, I, I know. He, he, they've been very critical of people like you, maybe even of you personally. I, uh, maybe maybe even of me personally. Yes. Right. right. So uh, I, I will simply say that I am not a never trupper. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, so where's the Berkey and conservatism? Well, I think it's in, and by the way, I say that I don't just use it as a metaphor. I've been steeped in Edmund Burke since I was uh, about 18. Uh, I mean, for one thing, I can't just bring him, uh, from the 18th century to the present in a, in a clean way, but I would say that his observations of the danger of, uh, of the French revolution are what many, I think, genuine kind of organic conservatives like, uh, uh, like those I, I hang around with, uh, would simply say, um, we're in a situation in which the the left, if in control, will undo any ability to try to recover uh, from this, the toxins coming from the left. And many of those you describe in just America, uh, they, uh, they will make recovery impossible. And uh, and it is, it is a binary. And again, th that's why I don't understand some people who say, uh, they just won't get, and especially people who have been deeply involved in politics in, in something like the Bush administration, which and President Bush was very kind to me, but but it, it's just hard to understand now how all of a sudden there's a, a list of things that are politically unacceptable. Um, it uh, it's pretty looks pretty convenient. Well, to I me. I don't know. I think I I interviewed Charles Murray uh, during the 2016 campaign, uh -huh. and and I remember he said quite quite directly, I've suddenly found that my world has fallen apart and all kinds yeah. of people who I thought believe the same things that I believe, no, turned out they didn't believe them at all. And what he was talking about were libertarians and, and Madisonians and maybe Burkeans who suddenly didn't seem to mind that um, uh, a kind of authoritarian sounding figure who didn't seem to have any interest in the institutions and principles of self-government, including the separation of powers, including um, some of the, the core principles of the Constitution. Um, suddenly he was OK by them. And so you've lost Murray. You've lost a few evangelicals like Weiner and Gerson. You've lost uh, people who aren't 
necessarily libertarian or Christian conservative, but who are ordinary Republicans, suburban Republicans who just couldn't bear the rhetoric and the vulgarity um, and the, the appeals to xenophobia and bigotry that seem to come so naturally from Trump. And they've become unwilling Democrats, let's say, temporary. It's a marriage of convenience. Uh, and at the same time, and this is a very interesting thing that just America cannot get its mind around, there's a whole number of black and Latino Americans, working class, who moved over to Trump in 2020, which shows that identity is not political destiny and the, the coming majority minority America is not necessarily a country in which Democrats are going to win elections without trying. So I think there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy. No, and, I get uh, that. And I, yeah, I want yeah. to move, uh, sure. didn't mean to interrupt you. I want to move to just America. I just want to say one other thing. I've been inside the, the campaigns uh, that where I live most of my life, but I've been there. And uh, so it, it's, it's interesting that almost every one of these campaigns of, uh, for the presidency since, uh, since 1980, let's just say, uh, has been, you have to vote for me, just look at the thread of the other guy. Right. Or, or the other candidate. Right. And uh, I, just, I just want to tell you, in all intellectual candor and, and moral candor, uh, that is the argument that I think produced uh, Donald Trump in, in 2016. And uh, came close uh, in in terms of uh, the the big picture uh, in 2020, and I'll just say, and I'm I'm not arguing with you the politics at this point, but I'll just say that the first say six to seven months of the Biden administration have not undermined that argument. Do you think of Barack Obama in 2008 as appealing on the same grounds? I don't think he ever in spoke that way. In 2008, yeah, the the first Obama yeah. campaign when he was elected. no, but he certainly did of the of the of the party. He certainly did of the party. I mean, it, he I, he did not demonize uh, John McCain. So I so I, I should that's a good clarification. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's the other party. Uh, he was all but, about un unity, and there are no red states, there are no blue states. That was Obama's, uh, and it it was a lie. But it was a very appealing lie that we kind of wanted to hear at that time. And and and, and I will say that there, there's there's something to that. But he ended up uh, being uh, the candidate who I think was most condescending uh, and dismissive of uh, of many of the people that he at least uh, asked to vote for him. Uh, and uh, and and in terms of uh, of of explaining Donald Trump, you also have to have Barack Obama and it's the politics. You know, I, I, I don't believe that, uh, it was primarily driven by race at all. Uh, I think had Barack Obama been less, uh, less committed to things such as, uh, same sex marriage, uh, less, uh, identified with the knowledge class and, uh, dismissive of, of, of people who didn't agree with him as as being uh, you know morally unworthy, I think it, it would it would have been quite different. I, I, I don't know how if we have enough time for me to 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 argue back, but I, I disagree. I was in southwestern Virginia during the midterm yeah. election of 2010, and I remember talking to a woman at a polling place who was just spitting mad about Obama. I said, "Well, what's wrong with him?" She said, "The way he talks, the way he dresses, he doesn't dress properly. He de he desecrates the Oval Office by the way he dresses and the way he talks." And I was thinking, "Who are we talking about? He's the man of great dignity. He speaks well. He doesn't use bad language. He's committed to his marriage and his children. What what do you mean?" And I all I could think was, "You mean he's black, don't you?" I didn't say that cuz there was no need to, but I think that's what she was getting at. But anyway, we we should maybe get to just America cuz yeah, there's I, a lot I, to I, say I, about that. I also understand in your reporting, you're going to talk to a lot of interesting people, but uh Barack right. Obama uh so far as I know, the only uh, you may remember, he got into a fashion controversy, not amongst conservatives uh, when he wore a, a tan suit, which they said was uh, so many oh, people right. said was the undignified, tan suit, undignified. Yeah. yeah, I don't think that's what she was talking about. No. All right. Just America. Uh, yeah. th th this is the this is the America. A lot of Americans are trying to figure out right now. 
And it's the world of not my children because they're too young. And in fact, their generation might well <laughs> rebel against the rebellion because it's so oppressive. Um, Just America is a generational uprising against, I think, smart America for the most part, because that's their parents. They're rebelling against their parents and against the leaders of institutions whether it's universities, newspapers and magazines, arts organizations, and the Democratic Party, who they think are sluggish and impure in their pursuit of justice. The key word is justice. And just America has a, a dim view of America as a country founded in injustice, um, of course, founded in slavery. 1619 is the founding year of the country. And so this uh, narrative has a kind of impatience to the point of frenzied opposition to anything that smacks of compromise, gradualism, um, ambiguity, complexity, the things that I think are kind of important if you really want to get yeah. anything done in politics, almost inevitable. It It is an illiberal narrative. It rejects some of the values that I think are at the heart of enlightenment liberalism, whether it's objectivity or due process or uh, the idea of individual freedom and equality. It thinks in terms of groups, in terms of hierarchies of oppression, um, and in terms of it, it has an almost instinctive desire to suppress what it finds to be incompatible with justice, not to argue with it, but to suppress it. And so in my world, whether it's journalism or academia, um, it has become a very powerful and almost doctrinaire narrative that I think uh, is really threatening to some of the values that that I think are important for democracy. Yeah, I think, uh, and I say this as, as a compliment, I think you've written the uh, the best one uh, paragraph summary of critical theory. It's on page 121 in your book, and you write you know, uh, that uh, critical theory upends the universal values of the enlightenment, objectivity, rationality, science, equality, and freedom of the individual. These liberal values are an ideology by which dominant groups subjugate other groups. All relations are power relations. Everything is political and claims of reason and truth are social constructs that maintain those in power. Unlike orthodox Marxism, critical theory is concerned with language and identity more than with material conditions. In place of objective reality, critical theorists place subjectivity at the center of analysis to show how supposedly universal terms exclude oppressed groups and help the powerful rule over them. Critical theorists argue that the Enlightenment, including the American founding, carried the seeds of modern racism and uh, and imperialism. I, I cannot think of a finer one paragraph. I actually cited you in an address I gave recently. Um, and as a theologian, I've been following critical theory since, again, I was very, very young, an undergraduate, when I had a basically a Marcusean as a, as a professor. But the, the question is, how in the world did this happen? You're the only person I know who's kind of dated it. You say that it, it jumped from the academy into the mainstream of American political discourse. I think you say 2014. Yeah. I mean, obviously, that's a little arbitrary because these things don't happen overnight. Sure. But so many things began right around 2014 to show how these ideas, which there's a great quote from D.H. Lawrence, the ideas of one generation become the instincts of the next. So that what a group of professors and philosophers um, teach in the 1980s and 90s become almost just the unconscious assumptions um, and biases of their students and even people who've never been in a college classroom. Um, and that's why when people on the left say, well, critical race theory, you're talking about high school. There, no one is teaching Kimberly Crenshaw and Derek Bell in high school. That's true, but well, they may was be true. teaching. Yeah, they, they may be teaching the uh, according to right. the assumptions that came out of those ideas. And I make a connection to the '70s. I think you were right. The Reagan movement was a movement of ideas. Milton Friedman said. 
We put ideas into circulation right. in order to wait for the moment when the politically implausible becomes the politically inevitable. And I think just as ideas inform free America, ideas inform just America too. They have had a powerful effect. How did it jump from the academy to the culture? I would say disappointment in Obama on the part of younger people who thought that he was going to bring in um, the millennium and instead the usual one step forward, two steps back of politics. Disenchantment with all the institutions we've been talking about because of the financial crisis, the Great Recession, uh, and the endless wars. Um, and a kind of generational muscle flexing. The boomers are now the enemies of the millennials, but the boomers did the same thing. They thought they were the first generation to walk the earth, that everyone else before them had been benighted. Millennials who are large as a number, a cohort, and strong and self-confident um, have in some ways followed in the footsteps of their parents. And finally, technology, um, social media, digital media have allowed people who ordinarily would not have much of a voice in our culture to have a very strong voice. People who are unknown, but who can create a group online and that group can then have a really strong say in what you can say and what you can't say and what happens to people who run afoul of that. So all of those factors seem to converge around that year 2014 and suddenly the New York Times is using language it had never used before. White supremacy becomes a common term, whereas it, before 2014 or thereabouts, it only referred to the Ku Klux Klan and the White Citizens Council. So there was a huge change in, in culture on the left, which is where the left has always dominated culture, while the right has dominated our politics, I would argue, in my lifetime. Now that culture is coming into politics. It's become almost a, a calling card if you want to have a career in the Democratic Party. It's difficult not to use that language and not to signal to yeah. those ideas uh, if you want to have a future. Now, if I were a liberal uh, and I, or of the left, and uh, I, I, so I, I make kind of a traditional, uh, I guess you could say this comes more from uh, English speaking thought than anything else on, on the right. And that is that there are liberals and conservatives, but to the left of liberals is the left and to the right of conservatives is the right, which is a larger collective that includes some people who are not conservative at all. Right. Um, but I, I, I see your uh, just America as very much the left. And it does, too, you know, in terms of its uh, it's basically Marxist analysis and. And all the rest. And, and it is, I say, the greatest um, surprise intellectually of my lifetime has been that critical theory could jump from uh, the academy where it was stuck for, you know, 60 years. Uh, and, and now it's in mainstream conversation. And, and I understand what you say about Kimberly Crenshaw and Derek Bell and others not being taught in schools, but now they are. I mean, <laughs> now they're footnoted in schools. And uh, the, the biggest problem I see with critical theory, speaking from the right, uh, and I, not just the right, but a conservative position, and as a Christian theologian is, there's no bottom uh, to that argument. There is no uh, th th there is no end to it. It is like a, a universal acid that just continues to burn because it assumes that whatever structure is in place is by definition unjust. I think that's quite perceptive, and it sh it it gets at uh, what's politically um, limited about it. It has such a um, pessimistic and critical view of everything. It subjects everything to criticism. What is being built? I mean, I know there were many young people in the streets last summer who believed they were building things and wanted to change things for the better. And I hope they can because a lot needed and needs to be changed, including in law enforcement and the criminal justice system. But they were hamstrung by the ideas and the language, which made it impossible to build, impossible to do more than criticize. And in fact, I think one of the tragedies of last summer was what could have been a movement for reform 
and reform where it's needed among poor people in the cities, in deprived areas, became a kind of uh, revolution of consciousness in the professional class, where uh, a lot of elite schools and universities and publications uh, went through a very public self-mortification in order to show that they had been redeemed. Um, and it does have this religious quality. Uh, there's a good article in the Atlantic right now called the new Puritanism by Ann Applebaum about all this. Um, that was a, a turn into a dead end. Politically, it's a dead end because that is not the way most Americans think. Um, and it's certainly going to isolate you as a party into the educated class. And you're going to lose more and more people in the working class who think that defund the police is not a slogan they can get behind. So, yeah, it's it's been um, uh, a movement for justice that has almost aborted itself, has stopped itself in its tracks. Um, and and yet those ideas are are powerful because they give you a sense of having figured out the world. Right. Like Which is liber- what we're all looking for. Right. Like libertarianism, like Marxism, like Freudianism. Like Christianity, it is a, a, a system that explains things and that once you are inside it, everything makes sense and you don't have to deal with contradictions and, uh, and, and, and exceptions and counter arguments. And in fact, you can't tolerate them so that you stifle them uh, by saying false consciousness, you're one of them, you're... So anyway, I, I, I think it's been a real mistake for the left and for and as much as it's a, a, a part of the Democratic Party, I think it's going to lead to electoral defeat. As a Christian theologian, by the way, I, uh, I believe God made us uh, to be meaning seeking uh, constantly and looking for an understanding of the world. And uh, that's part of the reason why these conversations, I think, uh, for me, are, uh, are invaluable. I really appreciate the time you've given us. I, I will say about this, this it, just think about just America for just a moment. Um, when I was uh, when I was in college and uh, in the in, and then in the 1980s, I, uh, I was very interested in Mao's cultural revolution, uh, just horrified by it, kind of the way Burke was horrified by. The French Revolution. And uh, yet one of the things that struck me is that one of the things that happened in, in Maoism and, and in the cultural revolution in particular was that eventually you only became the friend of the people by declaring yourself to be the enemy. And, and you know, in other words, everybody has to, eventually you have to admit all your sins against the revolution. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and that's where I want to say, you know, that, that's where this critical theory uh, and intersectionality, the, the problem is you may be oppressed today. You're the oppressor tomorrow at 3 p.m. And and there, and and so without an objective understanding of human good and human dignity and and even you might say a plausible conception of the good society, I, I don't see where we go from here. But that just makes this conversation all the more interesting to me. Well, one last point, um, yeah, Al, if I may, please. Um, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that real America and just America are kin. They are they've come up at the same period of disenchantment with. Uh, traditional American ideas of progress and of opportunity, and they are kin in their way of thinking because just as just America um, has a rigid idea of group identity determining everything about you, real America has aligned itself with a single person no matter what he says or does so that now uh, a candidate for the Senate in Oklahoma is challenging a very conservative incumbent on the grounds of what? Election security, because supposedly the election was stolen. And that is the only test of whether you're a true Republican. So for that to become real America's dogma is just as dangerous uh, to democracy as for just America to say, we cast you out um, because you use language that just yesterday all of us used. Um, and and they, they mirror each other, I think, in that way. Well, I, would I had love, to get that in. Sorry. I would love to have the opportunity <laughs> to come back on all that a, a, a bit. But I want to agree with you at one point of what you said okay. there. I taught an undergraduate class 
uh, had a phenomenal time doing it on uh, ideas and ideologies of the modern age. And it surprised me, these very committed young Christians, basically 18 to 22 years old, the one ideology that they felt was uh, affecting their generation more than the other was nihilism. And I think that is actually the temptation of both uh, what you call real America and just America. It is to just give up on the project of truth and, uh, and, and just resign to the inevitability is just power. It's all power. And, I think you've said it perfectly. That is, the, that is the end point of both of these narratives, and that's why uh, they, they, they're taking us in a direction I don't want to go. Well, nor do I. I'll say that as a Christian, uh, nihilism, uh, I think I can understand, uh, may well be, as these young people seem to think, the, uh, the greatest danger that uh, they're likely to face. George Packer, thank you so much thank you, for Dr. joining Mueller. me for Thinking in Public. I enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Many thanks to my guest, George Packer, for thinking with me today. If you enjoyed today's episode of Thinking in Public, you will find, well, more than 150 of these conversations at albertmuller.com under the tab, Thinking in Public. For more information on the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, go to spts.edu. For information on Boyce College, go to boycecollege.com. Thank you for joining me for Thinking in Public. Until next time, keep thinking. I'm Albert Muller.